Hiya, today we're going to be looking at the biochemistry of ethylene signalling in plants. So, discovery. In the early 20th century, a Russian plant physiologist showed that etiolated seedlings, which had been kept in the dark, grew horizontally as opposed to vertically, like they did outside the lab. And this was actually due to a leaking gas in the illumination system, it was ethylene. It was only until 1934, however, that it was proven chemically that plants actually produce this ethylene. Ethylene actually has quite a lot of biological functions in plants, just listed three here. The first one, fruit ripening, is what it's well known for, and it helps climacteric fruit like apples, bananas and tomato undergo ripening with an increase in ethylene levels. It's actually accompanied also by a respiratory burst. Second in the list, abiotic and biotic stresses. An example of an abiotic stress is hypoxia. For example, in some submerged plants, ethylene builds up and causes rapid stem growth to get out of the... Uh, water. And also in development, like in root, root growth agravitropisms, this is where the root is inhibited from growing directly downwards and goes sideways, which can help in waterlogged soils, for example. So, how do we make ethylene? Well, if we start off with SAM, s adenosylmethionine, which is a key methylator in biology, what we get from this via ACC synthase enzyme is methylthioadenosine, or MCA, and aminocyclopropane carboxylic acid, or ACC. Now, the ACC synthase is a dimer that resembles pyridoxal phosphate-dependent transaminases, and it's actually highly regulated, as ACC synthases catalyze the rate-determining step in ethylene production. And some of this regulation is via phosphorylation with MAP kinases and dephosphorylation by PP2A, and also via hormones, which we will see later on. Okay, so the key product of our last reaction was ACC. And ACC can be converted to ethylene using ACC oxidase. Now, ACC oxidase uses a non-heme ion as a redox center, and it, the reaction involves molecular oxygen and also the oxidation of ascorbate, or vitamin C. Now, it doesn't just create ethylene, though. It also creates CO2 and hydrogen cyanide. So the cyanide is actually removed by cy cyanoalanine synthase, and this prevents the toxic buildup of cyanide when you have high rates of ethylene production. So ethylene needs to get to its receptors, which are in the ER membrane. Ethylene is a gaseous molecule that can diffuse easily through membranes into different compartments of the cell. It's actually, in fact, more soluble in the hydrophobic membrane core than actually in the aqueous cytosol. So it makes it quite easy for the ethylene to get to its receptors in the ER membrane. However, the ER membrane is not a typical position for hormone receptors. It is also the position for cytokinin receptors, which we've covered previously. And the reasoning for the position of the ethylene receptors in the ER membrane may be because it's beneficial for it to interact with things like calcium signaling or cytokinin signaling. It also could be energetically more efficient for it not to be then transported all the way to the plasma membrane because ethylene can just diffuse through the plasma membrane to the ER. So we're just about to move on to the signaling components of ethylene. However, first of all, I just wanted to say about how the ethylene signaling components were mainly discovered. And this is through analysis of the Arabidopsis triple response, which the responses that you see when you subject a plant to a lot of ethylene. What you see is inhibition of hypercotyl and root elongation, increased radial swelling of the hypercotyl, and formation of an exaggerated apical hook. And so what they've done is they've said, now we have a plant with these features. If we knock out these genes, do these features go away? If so, it means the genes we've knocked out are possibly important in ethylene signaling. So this is a schematic of an ethylene receptor. As shown, it's a homodimer with disulfide stabilizing these dimers. Now, these resemble the histidine kinase receptors seen in bacterial environment sensing and cytokinin signaling. If you want more information on that, look at the cytokinin video. Starting from the top, the ethylene binding site is included in a copper binding site here. And this copper ion requires a Golgi-based RAN transporter, which is a copper transporter. And this binding site is between the two monomers. And each monomer has three or four transmembrane helices, depending on what subfamily we're looking at. So moving further down into the cytosol towards the C-terminus end, we get the GAF domain. This is important in allowing interactions between homodimers to create a macromolecular complex or cluster of receptors. Going down again, 
we see the histidine kinase domain, which is used in bacterial sensing systems to phosphorylate in trans, like one monomer will phosphorylate the other monomer. However, here, the kinase activity is not necessary for ethylene signaling, implying that probably the conformational changes that occur are involved in altering the signaling capabilities of this receptor and not the phosphorylation status. And finally, there is a receiver domain in some of the receptors, however not all, and this contains an aspartic residue if it's present, which in bacterial two-component systems is used as a phosphate acceptor from the histidine. Overall, ethylene actually binds the receptor and inhibits its ability to activate the downstream protein, which is a serine threonine kinase called CTR. In Arabidopsis, there are five ethylene receptors that all share similar structures. However, the number of transmembrane helices changes and also the histidine kinase region changes as well, whether it's conserved or it's diverged. And interestingly, where it's diverged, it often diverges in different manners. So we can split the receptors into two subfamilies. Subfamily one containing ETR1, ERS1, and subfamily two, which contains ETR2, ERS2, and IN4. Now, triple response assays show that there's actually a lot of functional overlap between these two subfamilies. And in Arabidopsis, it appears that subfamily 1 is actually more important in playing a role in the well-characterized bits of ethylene response, like I've discussed previously with the triple response. Higher order clustering of receptors can occur, and this can actually lead to heteromeric clusters. So this allows these clusters to have different compositions of different receptors, and this could play a functional role in specific responses in different plant tissues, for example. And this clustering, which is also seen in chemotaxis systems in bacteria, could also explain the broad range of ethylene sensitivity that's seen, because ethylene can be sensed across about six orders of magnitude, which is ridiculously high. The ethylene receptor interacts with the N-terminal regulatory domain on the left here of the serine threonine kinase CTR1, which is actually similar to RAF kinase, found to be implicated in several cancers in humans, and interestingly, the crystal structure of RAS, which is upstream of RAF, is similar to the receiver domain on the ETR1 receptor. So if we have ethylene present, the receptor can no longer activate CTR, and so it's in this inactive monomeric form. However, with no ethylene present, the ethylene receptor is able to activate the CTR, allowing it to dimerize as the CTR is active as a dimer. Now about the localization of CTR. So CTR1, although it lacks any transmembrane regions, it is actually present at the ER membrane due to its physical association with the receptors. Now, like I said, it's RAF or RAF-like. So it's interesting that we haven't identified any downstream factors of the MAP kinase pathway that CTR will activate. In fact, the main target or only target of CTR is IN2, which is also found in the ER membrane. So IN2, is an integral membrane protein with 12 transmembrane helices in the ER, just like the ethylene receptors in CTR. This means, because they're all localized in the same place, they can all interact and form these large multimeric signaling complexes. So IN2 is actually essential for ethylene signaling as mutants are defective in all ethylene responses. This hydrophobic bit here resembles N-ramp methyl ion transporters, however, no transporting has actually been shown. Another interesting feature is this hydrophilic C-terminus with a nuclear localization signal, or NLS. Now, when we have ethylene, it inactivates the receptor, and so CTR is inactive, and so there's no phosphorylation on the C-terminus of IN2. This allows the C-terminus to be cleaved off by an unknown protease and travel to the cytoplasm and nucleus to control translation and transcription of specific genes. So when there is ethylene, the cleaved C-terminus of IN2 can move into the nucleus and it can interact with this master regulator transcription factor, IN3. These are dimeric transcription factors that can bind to ethylene response elements and induce an ethylene response to genes. However, without ethylene, they have a very high turnover rate, which is often very good for sensitivity to the signal. And this high turnover rate is carried out by degradation by the proteasome after being polyubiquitinated by SCF E3 ubiquitin ligase complexes, which require F box proteins which provide substrate specificity 
to these ubiquitin ligase complexes. So we've got iron 3 binding to ethylene response elements, inducing genes like ERF transcription factors. However, binding to a response element only meant transcription in around 30% of cases when analysed, and this is actually quite common for master regulators. Of the transcripts that were induced, there was an abundance of transcription factors, like I said, for the ERF family. And this ERF family is very diverse, and this can coordinate ethylene's multiple functions. And the fact that a transcription factor induces a transcription factor creates what's called a transcriptional cascade. Now, if you look at the expression over 24 hours, what you see is there's actually a four-wave manner, and these four waves show different temporal expression patterns. The genes induced include those involved in RNA processing, cell wall growth, or pathway components for other plant hormones, and components of the ethylene signaling system as well. Interesting point about IN3 is that orthologs actually exist in soybean, rice, maize, moss, multicellular algae, and among others. And this indicates that IN3, and so it's possibly its function, is likely conserved in most plants. So, as usual, I'm going to talk about negative feedback. It's an important part of any signaling response to prevent overactivation. Now, it's mostly carried out here by IN3 transcriptional induction of negative regulators of the ethylene pathway. So first, we have induction of the receptors like ETR2 and also of that serine threonine kinase that's like REF, CTR1, and these all lead to a, an increase in IN2 phosphorylation, preventing cleavage of the C-terminus so it can't move into the nucleus and it can't stabilize IN3. So IN3 also induces F-box proteins. Now, as I said before, these are actually proteins that provide substrate specificity to SCF E3 ubiquitin ligase complexes that polyubiquitinate substrates and so trigger for their degradation by the proteasome. Now, examples of these F-box proteins are EPT1 and 2, and this regulates IN2, and EBF1 and 2, and this regulates IN3. In the presence of ethylene, the EBF family of F-box proteins is also downregulated by the cleave C-terminus of IN2, named IN2C here in purple, and this binds to the 3' untranslated region, or UTR, and it can sequester the mRNA in cytoplasmic P-bodies, which mean the rate of translation of this mRNA goes down. But even without IN2C, there's also negative regulation through XRN4, which is an exonuclease, goes from the 5' prime to the 3' prime end. So looking towards the crosstalk between different hormones and plants, um, looking towards ACC synthase, this catalyzes the rate determining step of ethylene production and specific isoforms are regulated by hormones. For example, the stability of some ACC synthase proteins is actually increased by cytokinin and resinosteroid treatment. Looking more towards pathogen defense now, we say that the response in plants to defend against pathogens is coordinated by ethylene, jasmonic acid, and salicylic acid, and how these hormone pathways uh, interact with each other. Finally, crosstalk is actually possible between ethylene and cytokine signaling pathways. Um, we think this is possible because of some in vitro evidence to suggest association between AHPs, which are cytokinin components, and phosphorylated ETR, which is the ethylene receptor and both use a TCS or two component system like signaling pathway. So overall, the ER membrane houses large complexes of receptor clusters that interact with CTR and IN2. With ethylene present, the CTR1 is inactive and so IN2C can stabilize IN3 in the nucleus. IN3 can then negatively regulate the signaling as shown here through feedback loops and this is often through transcription and IN3 can also induce transcriptional waves to create specific responses, for example, the transcription of ERF family of transcription factors. Okay, so just to finish off, here's the key proteins I've listed. Um, I hope the video and this table is helpful, and the next video will be on Brittano steroids. So yeah, thanks for watching.